we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. We're going to sing a song about heaven. That all right with y'all? We're going to sing a song about heaven. Here goes. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then what, Lord, will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then what, Lord, will I do? All oh, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me. And that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me. And now I honor go. Though I'll make it through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then what, Lord, will I do? The angels beckon me. From heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world anymore One more time Oh Lord, you know That I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home Then what, Lord, will I do? The angels beckon me From heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore no I can't feel at home in this world anymore I can't the Lord you can be seated praise God Praise God, everyone, this world is not my home. Yeah. Those are more than just lyrics. You are bound for a better place than this world. Hallelujah. Welcome back to the fifth week, the final week of our Afterlife series. My name is Chris Fluitt. I serve here as lead pastor of Redemption Church in the beautiful city of Plano, Texas. Don't we love Plano? We love this place. Yeah. I, um, we've, we're at the end of our uh, sermon series here. We're, we've got this final week right here I'm about to give to you. But first, I'd like to remind you of our text number. I would like to hear some good feedback. Uh, any thoughts on this series? Anything you learned? Anything you were glad to hear? Uh, how about uh, if you have any questions? Anything we left unanswered for you? And we'd also like to throw this at you. What is the subject you would want us to cover soon? That number is 214-856-0550. You can pull out your phone right now and text that in. The number is completely anonymous. The Afterlife. You probably know my next sentence, right? If you've been here every week. The afterlife is a lot more than just heaven and hell. The afterlife is a lot more complicated than just heaven and hell. We've been filling out our afterlife timeline. We're going to finish it off 
I'm sure there's a lot more stuff we could put on it, but, but specifically in the subjects of here's the afterlife, here's what happens after one dies, you can take a look at that afterlife timeline. Most people are curious as to what happens after this life. The Bible gives us answers. We talked in week one about the rapture, the catching away of a prepared bride. And we talked about the tribulation, that seven-year period of trouble. In the second week, we talked about the millennium reign and the rapture reward. In week three, we talked about heaven. Isn't it good to hear a sermon about heaven? Yeah. Amen. And last week, Last week, some of y'all were like, oh my goodness, we're preaching about hell. We preached about hell last week. I wanted to tell you hell is, a sermon on hell is one of the most powerful, profound things you'll ever hear. If you believe what the Bible says about hell, it ought to change the way you live forever. Can I get an amen on that? It's a real place. It's a physical place. You don't want to go there and you don't want anybody you've ever run into, anybody you've ever met to go there. All right? Uh, I encourage you to check out the podcast and the sermon notes we have posted on our website, all right, redemption-church.com. I want to remind you, we do have those sermon notes up there. We run through a lot of stuff, and we, we try to put extra material right in there to help you study out the Word. I'm certain that more than just a few of you are going to learn something new today. All right. Something new about the afterlife. Today, I'm going to be talking about the two resurrections. Everyone said two? Two. The two judgments two. and the second death. Two. And hopefully I don't preach too long. All right. Two. Your Bible speaks about the second, the two resurrections. We're going to jump right into this. We're going to talk about the two resurrections. Maybe you're already like, whoa, this is already new ground. I don't know about the subject of the two resurrections. What is this? Well, it's clearly lined out in your Bible. I want to tell you that I did not mistakenly not say rapture. No, we're talking about resurrections here. Not rapture, we're talking about two resurrections. There will be a series of resurrections, specifically two are laid out in your Bible. Daniel, the Old Testament prophet, prophesies resurrection. Daniel 12 and one. At that time, Michael, he's one of the archangels, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So we'll pa pause right here on Daniel 12, that big uh, hunk of verse right there. What is the timeline in this verse? Where in our timeline does this verse get fulfilled? Tribulation. Very good. Tribulation. We know because there, there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. This is going to be the biggest trouble of all time. Anytime you hear about the biggest trouble of all time. Every time you hear a piece of news that says, that's the worst thing ever. I can't believe it's that bad. I can't believe, man, this is, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Anytime you're feeling that, that is leading you to a revelation that we are getting closer to the worst time of all, and it's called the tribulation. So in your timeline, that's where Daniel 12 and 1 falls, the seven-year tribulation. It's a time of distress not ever seen before. Looking on to Daniel 12 and 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to, say it, everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. So if you had a choice, real quick, I know y'all are really smart people. If you had a choice of which one you were going to awake to, which one would that be? Everlasting. everlasting life, very good. Jonathan, you got to study up. You got that one wrong. We must point out two things here about Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Re here's the first one. I want to be emphatic about this. I want you to get it. Resurrection from the dead is not just a New Testament idea. All right. It's not just a New Testament idea. The prophets of old knew that Messiah would raise the dead. Yeah. They believed in more than there's just some guy that's going to come and he's going to straighten out our government. There is some guy that's going to come and he's going to kick out Rome. No, the prophets of old, the men of old that knew and walked with God understood that the Messiah would resurrect everyone. That the Messiah would resurrect and bring back the dead 
back to life. That is no small revelation. And it blows me away. Job believed this. Moses believed this. Adam believed this. Enoch believed this. Daniel believed it. David believed it. And I just gave you one verse. There's so much more in your Old Testament that points you to the idea of Jesus, the Messiah, the true Holy One of God coming and bringing us back to life. Anybody got that life at work in their life already? You got that life. You got resurrection power already in you. Woo. Praise God. Although, here's point two, although this great number is resurrected, we got to tell you, they don't all go to the same place. Some are resurrected to everlasting life. Some are resurrected to shame and everlasting contempt. Some to everlasting life. That sounds like heaven. Bible scholars here. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jonathan, it sounds like hell. Good job. Good job. All right. Good. Uh, And then point three, remember that this resurrection is tied to end time prophecy. This specifically, it's tied to the tribulation. There there are some people in Christianity that say that the resurrections have already happened, that the rapture has already happened, but it's tied to the tribulation. So if they're going to say it's already happened, which Paul talks to us about, he says, don't let somebody confuse you and make you think that Jesus has already come and not gotten you, okay? That's what Paul talks about. And if someone says it's already happened, then they need to also show you where the tribulation happened. The scripture in context was completely speaking of the tribulation and speaks of those that are delivered. And that gives us a time frame. Here's some other verses on the resurrection. Luke 14 and 14. I'll just read these to you. And you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Acts 24 and 15. And I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be amazed at this, Jesus says, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Pause. What? How cool is that? All that are in their grave, the next, you want to know what happens in, for you in the afterlife? If you are dead in your grave, the next thing you're going to hear is the voice. You're going to hear the voice of Jesus. Wow. All right, verse 29. And come out. Those who are in the grave are going to hear the voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Revelation 20 marks the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial reign. And it's really fascinating. Uh, Remember that Satan's on a chain. Remember that? But there's all kinds of interesting stuff. Revelation 20 and 4. We've read that a few times. We're going to read it again. Let's read it. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now we've touched on this verse almost every week of this series. Uh, There are already those, it says at the beginning, seated on thrones who are given authority to judge. We feel like this is the prepared bride who was caught away. They were raptured by Jesus at some point in the tribulation, whatever you believe, pre, mid, post. We're not going to get into all that. Remember that the rapture is an, is an event that is tied, it's connected to the tribulation. Some people think that the rapture is pre, mid, or, or post. Uh, let's concentrate on something new in this verse today. John the Revelator sees, that, sees those who died because of their testimony. They died, they lost their head because of the word of God. And there was some specifics about these people. So they died for that purpose, but also they had not worshipped the beast or his image. There's all kinds of freaky things in the the book of Revelation. The beast is the Antichrist, and it also extends to his one world government. It extends to all of his evil kingdom. That's him. Just like like Jesus' kingdom is the gospel right? And all the extension of the gospel. The, the Satan's kingdom is the beast. Got that picture. 
Jesus is the lamb that's slain and lays his life down. And Satan's kingdom represents something totally different. The beast that's come to devour. Whose kingdom you want to be part of? Jonathan, got the right answer? All right, good. Uh, So these people had not worshipped the beast or his image. Real quick, what's this image? It's really crazy. that in, In Revelation, it talks about this statue that comes alive and moves around and does things that it should never be able to do. And that everybody bows down and worships it a little bit like uh, the Hebrew boys in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had to worship uh, the, the, every time uh, the music played, they had to bow down to, I believe, Baal and worship the God of Nebuchadnezzar. The same thing is happening kind of like this situation, except it's going to be freaky. If you don't understand this, if you don't have a revelation of all this stuff, you can be shaken because this thing is going to do things a normal statue shouldn't be able to do. We're not talking electronics here. We're not talking about trickery. We're talking about demonic power. We're talking about something that Hollywood, it would take them years and years and years to try to duplicate and they would never come close to it. They could never do it. But Satan's going to do that right in front of everybody and everybody's going to bow down and worship him. Oh, not everybody. Not the people in Revelation 20, verse 4. Also, they don't worship him and they have not received his mark on their, say it, forehead or on their hands. Okay, this is really important, all right? Anybody wants to go putting some kind of government mark or some economic power mark on your forehead or your hand, run away from it. Because the people in 20 and verse 4 that are resurrected, they never worshiped that beast, nor did they take his mark upon them. That is some huge information. Don't do it. You got me? Make up your mind right now. Do not do it. So what is this all talking about? Well, it's, it's the beast and the antichrist. and It's a one world government. I want, to, I want you to get this, that just as Christ is God incarnate, Jesus is God wrapped in flesh. He is the embodiment of God. The Antichrist is the polar opposite of that. The Antichrist is Satan incarnate. It is Satan wrapped in flesh. It is Satan in a bod. This verse is specifically talking about those who die because of their faith in Jesus. During the tribulation period. What happened to these people? Well they came to life. And reigned with Christ. A thousand years. They came to life. If you want the hope of a resurrection. Like some of these people. You're going to have to be willing to give your life. And you have to be willing to say no. Even if it costs you your own head. Revelations 20 and 5. The rest of the dead. Did not come to life. What happened to the rest of the people that were dead? They stayed dead. They did not come to life. Very good. Until when? The thousand years were ended. Well, what's the thousand years? The millennium reign. The millennial reign where Christ is on the earth ruling the world. There are people that are resurrected. But the rest aren't. They are resurrected after the millennial reign. So the first... The people in 20 and 4 of Revelation, that is the first resurrection. That's what it says at the end of Revelations 20 and 5. This is the first resurrection. This happens after the end of the tribulation, thinking about our timeline here, and the beginning of the millennial reign. It happens in that time period. It matches up with Daniel, except Daniel also mentioned those that are resurrected to shame and contempt. That does not happen at this point in time. When does it happen? Verse 5 tells you the rest of the dead did not come back, in, back to life until the thousand years were ended. So this is going to frame our idea of two resurrections. Do you understand it? One's at the beginning of the millennial reign. One's at the end of the millennial reign. Are you with me? Two resurrections. I think we can add something now to our timeline. Let's look at it. The first resurrection happens at the, after the tribulation. See that added there up in orange above the, above the millennial kingdom. Towards the beginning of the thousand year millennial reign. That's where that happens. And number two, the rest of the dead are resurrected after that thousand year reign. I see 
a rapture. Do you see a rapture over the tribulation? And two resurrections. Post-tribulation rapture proponents will try to say that the rapture and the first resurrection are the same event. But we don't see that here in Revelation 20. Who are the people that are raptured in Revelation 20 and 4? Those that lost their head for Christ, did not worship the beast or take his mark. Doesn't say the dead in Christ to rise and those that died before the tribulation are in the first resurrection. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that those that were alive and caught up to meet him are in the first resurrection. It admits that whole idea. So I want to bring to you that there is a rapture and there is a first resurrection. Some people get really snarky and say, oh, so you believe in three resurrections because they call the rapture a resurrection. And we're going to handle that in just a second. There is already, at the point of this first resurrection, I want you to know that there is already a prepared bride ruling and reigning with Christ. All right. there, you could, I want you to get this picture that someone could be taken in the rapture. Let's say it's a wife, it's, it's your wife, but you're, you're the husband and you're left, but you gave your life to Jesus and now you're in the first resurrection. That is the moment you're gonna be reunited. You wanna know when you're gonna be reunited? Are we gonna have to wait till heaven to be reunited? No, you don't have to wait for the millennial reign to be done to be reunited with somebody. Revelations 20 and six says this, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. What Describe the people that are in the first resurrection. They are blessed and holy. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is an unbelievable promise. It's really the same promise that those that are raptured have. What is a priest of God? They walk into the presence of God. They walk where no one else can walk, in the temple. And that temple shows us heaven. So they they go right up to the throne. They go into the throne room of God. They are right there at the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the throne, the mercy seat of God. And these people are blessed and holy and have that promise. Have you heard that if you miss the rapture, you have no hope of heaven? Have you ever heard that? I've heard that preached before. I've heard that preached before. Man, if you miss the rapture, don't want to be you. You've got no chance, sucker, right? Now, don't, go, don't get me wrong. You want to make the rapture. You aren't misunderstanding me, right? You want to make the rapture. But if, if you don't, I want to tell you, I want this to ring out in your head, while everyone's freaking out and everyone's worried, everyone's falling on their face, falling, crying that rocks would fall on them and cover them and all that craziness of, uh, that, that Revelation tells us about, I want you to remember the words of your pastor right here. There is still hope for you. You can be in the first resurrection. Stay true to God. Stay true to God, all right? Here's what you need to do. Number one, do not take the mark. Do not... Worship the Antichrist. Do not bow before his image. And number two, be willing to die for Christ. Can I tell you, we ought to do that now. We ought to, number one, let's not bow to idols. Let's not worship other things. Let's not put other things of more importance above Christ and get our priorities out of whack. Why don't we do that right now? Let's be willing to do anything for Christ right now let's do it let's do that i guarantee you if you live that way you wouldn't just be ready for the first resurrection you'd be ready for the rapture of jesus christ amen so let's not give our life to other things and let's be willing to do anything for jesus christ what a crazy concept praise god that's what we need i got a question for you who is the first person to ever be resurrected talking about the two resurrections we'll, we'll little trick question here who is the first person to ever be resurrected. Now I'm gonna give you a list of people and I'll give it to you in chronological order. The widow's son that Elijah raised in 1 Kings 17. The Shunammite woman that Elisha raised, uh, 2 Kings 4. Uh, in, In 2 Kings 13, the dead bones of Elisha raised a man to life. How cool is that? (laughs) That's a pretty cool prophet. Uh, He post-mortem raised somebody to dead. It's, it's pretty, raise somebody to life, not to death. All right, yeah. Number four, in Luke 7, 
Jesus raises the widow's son. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead in Matthew 9. That's uh, number five. Number six, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I bet y'all knew that one. John 11. Many saints are resurrected at Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew 27. Don't ever forget about that one. I love that idea. That as Jesus is dying on the cross, there's so much resurrection power already in him. That as he splits from this world into the afterlife... People are resurrected and set free from Sheol and are walking around and testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. What a dramatic, amazing picture. Praise God. Oh, man. Oh, God doesn't play around, y'all. He does not play around. He wanted everybody to know Jesus was the Messiah. All right, number eight, Christ was resurrected. You better have known that one, Sean. All right, Matthew 28, that's where that happened. And then in... Number nine, Peter raises a female named Tabitha from the dead in Acts chapter nine. Bonus points to whoever knows Tabitha's other name. Dorcas. Dorcas. Any excuse to say Dorcas in church. All right. Dorcas. Dorcas. Number 10, Paul was raised from the dead in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And then number 11, Paul raises Eutychus. From the dead in Acts chapter 20, I'll spare you the Eutychus joke this time. All right. So these are people that are resurrected in your Bible. So who was the first to be resurrected? Well, chronologically, it would be Elijah raising the widow's son, chronologically. But Paul says, it's Jesus. Paul says, Jesus is the first to be resurrected. How does this happen? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 tells us, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits, everyone said the first fruits, of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, for since death came through a man, the erection of the dead comes also through a man. So he is resurrected first and everyone else is resurrected through him. Chronologically, Elijah was resurrected, but he, he wasn't resurrected through himself. He was resurrected through Jesus. Jesus, as we all are, all right? And nobody's resurrected through Elijah, as good of a prophet is. We are all resurrected through Christ. Everybody that's going to be raised to life is going to be resurrected through Christ. How about that idea? There's an atheist. He's dead in the grave. He's going to be resurrected by who? Jesus. It's going to be like the altercation of of Paul in Acts chapter 9 when he's hit to the ground and he says, who are you, Lord? And the, the voice comes, oh, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. It's going to be just like that. It's going to be amazing. All right. So that's 1 Corinthians 15. Looking on verse 22, for is in Adam all die. Everyone that's lined up behind Adam, they die. die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. Everyone that lines up after Christ will be made alive, verse 23, but each in his own turn. Everybody's going to be made alive, but you got to wait your turn. Take a number, wait in line, in their own turn. Christ, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Who has the first turn? Christ. And that's really good because in order for us to all be resurrected, he also had to take the first turn in death. It says that he's the firstborn of death. He's the firstborn of that. I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. I'm really excited about it. All right. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. It's not in my notes, so I hope I remember. Remind me if I don't tell you the thing about the firstborn of the dead. All right. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Verse 21 says that the resurrection comes through Christ. Verse 28, 23 says the resurrection comes in turns. First Christ and those that belong to him. But why isn't Elijah raising the widow's son the right answer to who was resurrected first? Here is why. We must understand the Hebrew concept of resurrection. Okay, so two points on on the Hebrew concept. First, a true resurrection is one that returns a person to a permanent, eternal state of new life. One in which the person is never to be subjected to death again. Hebrews 9, 27, Romans 6, 8 through 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 are examples. But it's not a resurrection if you die again. All right? Did Elijah die again? Did the, the 
Everyone else in this list, except one, died again. Who is the one that never died again? Jesus. Jesus. All right. One day when Christ raises you from the dead, you will never die again. Because death has no mastery over Christ. Let's look at Romans 6 and 9. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. He, death has no mastery over him. He's got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And when he raises you from the dead on this day, when he resurrects you, you will never die again. You will have mastery over death through Jesus. Praise God. Death is defeated. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Second point on the resurrection. The resurrection is a transformation into a new body. One that is fundamentally different than the one that preceded it. Elijah was not, uh, that, that, that story was not uh, resurrected into a new body. Lazarus was not resurrected into a body. Eutychus, on and on. But Jesus, he had a glorified body. Paul describes the nature of true resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he teaches that the body of a resurrected believer is a new better form than the previous body. He says, whatever you got now, you just get a load of what you're gonna have after the resurrection. You're gonna have a brand new body. Paul describes it like this, that mortality has put on immortality. You put on immortality, that means you'll never die, that your body will never age, that your body will never be sick and get and, and depreciate. You put on immortality. As I say this, no one but Jesus Christ has ever been resurrected. Sure, people have come back to life, but nobody has had a true resurrection where they never die again and they've got a brand new glorified body. He is alive forever with the glorified body. The next people to experience the resurrection that Jesus, only Jesus can bring, the next people to take their turn as 1 Corinthians uh, 1523 says, are going to be one of two groups. Who they are. Uh, number one, those dead and alive taken in the rapture. They will rise to a glorified body. Depending on where that happens in the tribulation, based on your belief, this could also be, if you like believe post, post trib, here's other people that might be resurrected next. Uh, the two witnesses in Revelation 11. If you don't know about the two witnesses, get out your Bible, read Revelations 11. It's amazing. There's these two revel, uh, witnesses. Everybody wants to know who they are. Uh, we don't know who they are, but they are going to, everyone in the world is gonna have their attention on them. They're gonna witness to the world and the world's gonna destroy them and they're gonna lay their bodies dead three and a half days. But at the the end of three and a half days, God is going to raise them up. He's going to resurrect them and they ascend to heaven. If the raptured aren't the next people to have a resurrection, those two witnesses are your next uh, that are definitely gonna be resurrected. Those in the first resurrection will reign with Christ. We read about that in Revelations 24. First resurrection, they're gonna reign with Christ. Just like those who are raptured will reign with Christ. Christ. We talked about that rapture reward. I'm telling you that those that lost their head for Jesus and, and they are in that first resurrection, they are going to receive a rapture reward. The martyred in the tribulation join those who are raptured. Uh, just as there are two resurrections, there are two judgments. We'll talk about the second resurrection in a little bit. First, I want to talk about the two judgments. Romans 14 and 10. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Who will stand before God's judgment seat? All are gonna stand before a judgment seat. And 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, while in the church, whether good or bad. All right. So in the context of both of these scriptures, it is clear that Paul is referring to 
believers right here in 2 Corinthians 5.10, not unbelievers. The judgment seat of Christ is one of the two judgments we're going to talk about today. Two judgments. Now, we hate the word judgment, don't we? I'm not a big fan of that word, no. Not, not loving it. Uh, but this word is also translated as reward. Do you like that word a little bit better? Yeah. Reward, seed, uh, reward seat of Christ. Those that stand before the judgment seat of Christ will receive what is due them. And it's going to be reward. At the judgment seat of Christ, you will receive Reward. We covered some of the rapture reward in week one. This is where the overcomer receives crowns. We talked about those crowns. This is where we are all invited to sit in his throne, all those wonderful scriptures. As the judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ, we are saved by his grace. Don't get me wrong. You're not saved by what you do, but you're awarded according to what you've done. Following me. You're rewarded for faithfulness. You are rewarded for obedience. When you looked in the Bible and you saw that the Bible told you to do this in your life and you said, okay, God, I'm gonna do it. You're gonna be rewarded for that. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. When you do that, you should know you're gonna be rewarded for that. You're not saved according to that, but you're rewarded according to that. We will also be given an account we will give an account and receive what is due us for what we did in the body of Christ, whether good or bad, okay? Don't do bad things in the body of Christ, okay? Because you'll be rewarded, judged for that also. The secret sin in your life, can I tell you something? At the judgment seat of Christ, all of it's gonna be laid bare. The secret sin in your life that you would be horrified if anyone knew about You've done your best to make sure nobody knows about it. You think you've, you've got it. You've, you've learned the art of keeping the sin under wraps. You keep doing it and you're so happy no one knows about it. Let me tell you, the judgment seat of Christ, everybody's gonna know about it. I just ruined your secret sin for you. Next time you go to your secret sin, you're gonna remember what I just said. It's gonna be known. It's already known. It's known, okay? The missed opportunities where you could have served him but didn't for whatever reason, they're gonna be known. They're gonna be brought up. We will give an account for every idle word, every empty promise that we made here on earth. Every time we repented, but we walked back into sin, it's gonna be known. All our hypocrisy, it's gonna be known. All will be laid before the judgment seat of Christ. I say all of this to tell you it will be evident at the judgment seat of Christ that none of us deserve to be before his throne. It will be evident at the judgment seat of Christ. Not one of us will say, ha, got a pretty good clean bill of health, didn't I? None of us. It will be evident that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. It will be evident that we are all sinners and we're not deserving of heaven. We are deserving of death. Romans 6, 23. But grace is at the judgment seat of Christ. Grace is at the judgment seat of Christ. What is grace? Grace is receiving what we did not, could not deserve. All your righteousness, if you think you're going to come up to the righteous, to the, to the judgment seat of Christ with all your righteous deeds, I got a scripture for you. Our righteousness is as filthy, dirty, gross, you wouldn't touch them with a 10 foot stick, rags. Right? But at the judgment seat of Christ, He's gonna lay all of that open, but we're gonna be received. At the judgments, nobody's gonna be at the judgment seat of Christ and he's gonna say, what are you doing here? You weren't supposed to be here, Sean, and throws you in hell. That's not gonna happen to anybody. But also we're gonna feel, we're gonna feel, we're gonna feel like everyone. It's gonna feel like 
I should have done more for Jesus. I wish we'd feel that way right now, Redemption Church. At the end of our day, at the end of this service, at the end of your week, while you're thinking about your week, you need to feel this way. I should have done more for Jesus. I should have done more. I should have, man, I believe we're gonna walk into a spiritual dimension where we're gonna say, whoa, prayer does all that. I should have prayed more. Oh, wow, faith does all that. I should have walked in faith more. Okay, Uh, I'm telling you, we gotta get a hold of that. That's the judgment seat of Christ. We're I, we're going to stand before it if we're in that rapture. I want us to look back at our afterlife timeline here. The rapture are taken to the judgment seat of Christ. I've added that above the seven-year tribulation there, there in blue. You get the rapture, you shoot over there to the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where we receive reward. From there, they are taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelations 19, uh, 6 through 9 talks about that. It is a celebration. We don't leave the marriage, fee, the, uh, the, the judgment seat of Christ going, oh gosh, I didn't get much, or, or feeling down. No, you end and you go to a place of celebration. Is this heaven? No, it's not the final place that you would call heaven. It's not. It is a marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember earlier this year in the Bachelor series? You might go back and look at that. Um, we talked about the Jewish wedding process. And in that process, weddings are a huge party. And you've got the marriage ceremony, but after the marriage ceremony, you see the judgment seat of Christ is like that marriage ceremony where he receives you even though he shouldn't, he receives you. After that, we enter into the after party. And it lasts for seven days in the Jewish wedding process, seven days. I believe that correlates to the seven-year tribulation. That's what I believe. After the marriage supper, what happens? The raptured return with Jesus and his angels where? Where do we return? To earth. And what are we going to do? Defeat the Antichrist. Defeat the false prophet. Defeat his army. Defeat Satan and all his works. You want to be a part of that? I want to be a part of that. That's awesome. The raptured reign with Jesus along with the martyred who are resurrected. We see that promise in scripture. The martyred resurrected do not stand before the throne, the judgment seat of Christ. We don't see anywhere in scripture where that happens. So what's up? Did they just bypass judgment? No, it seems like they gave their account in the tribulation when they gave their life. That's what I see in scripture. Um, So that is the first resurrection and the first judgment. You wanna be in the rapture and that first judgment seat of Christ. If you can't be there, be in the first resurrection. All right, and anyone can be there, I believe. Let's read Revelations 20. After Satan is defeated at the end of the millennial reign, And he is thrown into the lake of fire. Let's read it, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. How many thrones are there? How many people sitting in it? One. One one and one. Earth and sky fled from his presence. Imagine that. (laughs) They disappeared. They went away from his awesome presence. Who can stand Before the Lord Almighty. Not even heaven and earth. Earth and sky flees from his presence. How much more your enemies? Preach somebody. All right. And there was no place for them. Revelations 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, gray and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. So we got books. And we've got a second singular book we're talking about, the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades. Sheol, Sheol, sorry, just like that. Sheol that we talked about last week, it's going to be emptied. 
gave up the dead were, that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So let me explain some things here. When we're talking about hell, we're really talking about the lake of fire. That is the final destination of Sheol, that that holding place for people that don't have Christ. And that is thrown into the lake of fire. Just like heaven comes down to earth, comes nearer to us than it's ever been, Hell and sin and hatred and all the depressing, awful things that we want to get away from are going to be cast further away from us than they've ever been, never to be seen again. This tells us about the second resurrection. And this scripture that we read tells about the second judgment. It is known as the great white throne judgment. Most people believe that everyone who stands before the great white throne in the second resurrection are going to be doomed to hell. I'm going to disagree with that in just a moment. But most people, uh, let's look at this afterlife time, after, after timeline. Most people that believe in this great white throne judgment, there it is right in front of eternity. It's after the millennial kingdom. It's after Satan has been defeated again at the end of the millennial reign. We have that great white throne judgment. Most people believe that you go straight down into hell if you're standing there. Ro- Romans 2 and 5. Um, There are books recording everything those who stand before his throne had done. We sell those books. Romans 2.5 kind of echoes this. It says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. The evil that you're doing, there is something worse than, than going into eternity without Jesus. It is storing up tons and tons of wrath for the day you step into eternity without Jesus. It's right there. Are you doing any of this? Stop it. Are you storing up wrath? Are you, if you're lying, you're storing up wrath. If you're committing adultery, you're storing up wrath. If you're feeding your lusts, you're storing up wrath. If you're uh, not being uh, generous, you're storing up wrath. If you're serving another God, you're storing up wrath. There's a lot of things you could be storing up. Are you doing any of it? Gut check time. Stop it. Repent of it right now. Well, nobody knows about it. It's not really hurting anything. It's hurting everything. Step away from it. The Bible's warning you. I'm warning you. Step away from it. Repent. Now this is, you can clap for that. Step away from it. You'll be better off without it anyway. Amen. Amen. Now this is heavy stuff. I know. The deciding factor at the judgment seat is not the stuff you've done. That's heavy. It stores up wrath. But here's the deciding factor, Anda. It's the Lamb's book of life. The Bible's very emphatic about this. There's no wiggle room in this. Those whose name is not in the Lamb's book of life join the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan in the lake of fire. And that's known as the second death. Let me talk about the second death real quick. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. Follow me? That's what the Bible says. He's the firstborn of those that are asleep, those that are dead. Paul says this. So this is really interesting. I've always been confused. I've always been like, why is the Antichrist and the false prophet the first people that are thrown into the lake of fire? Why not Satan? Why doesn't he wait? Here's why. Satan is always trying to copy God. He's always trying to knock off his plan and and come up with another version of it a mirrored version of it he never can improve it so we've got christ over here and we've got the antichrist over here we've got the mark that the bible says is he are sealed by the holy spirit and he puts his mark on you he puts his name on you and then we got the mark of the beast all of this right we, we see all this stuff right yeah. well so i want you to get this that the antichrist is the first person that is thrown into the second death the lake of fire Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead and God has set it up. So it, I feel it like this. It's like, Satan, you, you wanna copy me? All right, so I'm gonna make sure that your antichrist is the firstborn of the second death. Yeah. Yeah. 
Jesus is the firstborn of the dead and your antichrist and your false prophet, you're gonna watch them be thrown into the second death and Satan, you're next. Oh man, what a foolhardy plan, Satan. You are in trouble. If you live this life without the Lord and you die, you will be resurrected for a second death. The second death is an existence completely devoid of the source of life, God. It's really why it's called the second death. What's that about? It's devoid of real life in God because God's presence is no, not there. But if you live this life and meet the Lord Jesus and become born again, like Jesus talks to us in John 3 and 5, then at the most, you only die once. There is no second death for you. There's no second death for those that are born again. You will always be in the source of life, God Almighty. So you need to decide right now, do I want to be born twice and die once? Or do I want to be born once and die twice? You must be born again. You need to be born again. You need to be born of the water and the spirit. A lot of people argue about what that's about. Let me just come right out and tell you. John Peter says it like this. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how you are born again. That's what you need. Yes. Now, most people are going to disagree with, with what I have to say right here. So I want you to take it and measure it for yourself. But here it is. Most people believe that everyone who stands before the great white throne are bound for hell. And I'm going to offer you a different view. I believe that they see this way because they're kind of off on some other issues that I don't agree with everyone on. I believe that not every believer is raptured. We've talked about that and, and how the promise of the victorious overcomer and the prepared bride, that those are the people that are raptured, right? No, that is something the majority of Christianity doesn't believe. In fact, they will tell you at church after church that you've said the sinner's prayer, now you're ready for the rapture. Not necessarily so. No, the rapture is for the overcomer that's a prepared bride. Okay? But at the same time, I'm not saying if you miss the rapture, you're bound for hell, which most people are saying. So, let's even this out. I believe that at the great white throne, God will be separating the sheep from the goats. Just as Jesus told us in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. There is a time when he's going to be separating the sheep from the goats. Goats. So where is that? It's not at the rapture. Where is that? It's not at the first resurrection. Where is that? It's at the second resurrection. Doesn't it also seem obvious? It's an obvious implication left unsaid in Revelations 20. It says that those that are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. So isn't it an obvious left unsaid situation that those, the, the book of life is going to be there. So if anyone's at the great white throne judgment and their name is found in the Lamb's book of life, they will not be thrown into the lake of fire. How's that for a theologian? All right, simple. At any rate, let me, let me just bring it down to this. We don't want to be there. We do not want to be at the second judgment. We do not want to be in the second resurrection. We want to be with Jesus ASAP as soon as possible. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. We want to be a prepared bride. We want to be the ones laying down our life for the bridegroom already, right now. We're about to have a time of prayer, but before we do, can you take a moment to be very honest? Can you answer this question? Are you prepared? Are you ready for the surprise appearance of the groom, Jesus Christ? Are you ready right now for the afterlife? Not a kind of sort of thing? I think so. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. Come on, you know that's not what it's about. Are you ready? Are you born again? Are you looking for his return? We talked about those that love his appearing. Are, is that you today? Are you, are you spending, are you trusting daily in him? Or do you only think about him on a certain block of time on Sunday? 
These altars are open right now. Why don't you come pray? Why don't you come talk to Jesus about it? I want everybody in this place to be ready for the coming of the Lord. If you want special prayer in this place, we have a very live Jesus. He's got resurrection power. He can, he can raise the dead in you. If you want special prayer, you come in the first two feet. We're gonna pray with you. And we believe that God is going to do whatever you need him to do. Right now in Jesus' name, come on, let's reach out to the Lord.